I'm very happy to be here uh, to celebrate this happy occasion. Let me say a few words about Mike. Uh, I think I met Mike in a long time ago now, and I think it was 1987 when he was still a student at Caltech. And I think I and many other people immediately realized that he was an exceptional talent. Now, he was working on two-dimensional conformal field theories, which was something that our group at Chicago was uh, focusing on. And we were very lucky that he decided to join us at Chicago as a postdoc. We were even more fortunate when Mike agreed to join uh, us at Rutgers, where Daniel Friedan and I from Chicago, Nadi Seiber, who was then at Weizmann, and Tom Banks, who was then at Santa Cruz, decided to move there to start a new string theory group. And when I was looking at pictures online and Mike, this was the one that I could immediately recognize was at Rutgers. This is the familiar seating at uh, Bush Dining Hall where I remember eating countless meals together. I can't remember, it probably was literally hundreds of slices of Hawaiian pizza that I consumed during our many lunches there. Uh, well, that move was one of the most exciting adventures of my professional life. And the work Mike and I finished up there when we first moved was one of uh, the most exciting and enjoyable collaborations I've been part of. And Mike's just speaking personally to you. I, I was very lucky that uh, uh, to have you as a collaborator. Then. And I look back on that as a, a really exciting time. So let me start uh, by reminding you about a bit about that work. And that work concerned matrix models of string theory. And the basic idea, beautiful idea, uh, well, going back to these authors, was that you could think of the tuft double line diagrams of uh, some perturb perturbation theory of a matrix ordinary integral as describing discretized world sheets, here triangulated world sheets of some kind of string theory. And so a very simple model of string theory would, could be described the integral over a one large N matrix with some non-Gaussian weights to make these uh, vertices. In the end going to infinity limit, that would pick out the spherical topology. And you scale the coupling of the, here the cubic term uh, in a special way toward a special, actually a large end phase transition value. And the results you got agreed with the continuum Liouville treatment of this two dimensional quantum gravity. And this was remarkable. And it was remarkable to many of us because at the time, there are tremendous advances in the development of perturbative string theory after uh, the initial breakthroughs that uh, in particular Green and Schwartz led us to uh, in, in the perturbative theories. And, but the need for a non-perturbative definition of string theory was acute. There were all kinds of questions like supersymmetry breaking and so on that uh, were clear that uh, we needed to understand non-perturbative string theory if we were going to get a handle on it. And these matrix integrals, although they're little toys, they make sense at finite n, at least formally. And because G string is like one over n, that's at finite coupling. And so they look like they were a tool that could define string theory beyond perturbation theory. Now, as you actually know, you need to do something a little bit fancier. You need to actually double scale these integrals. That is take n to infinity, the coupling to this critical value in a way holding this product fixed without some power. And that gives what G string is. Now this is one over G string, I guess. And in that limit, because these simple models uh, are solvable, you get exact solutions to these simple non-perturbative thing theory, string theories. And the answers are related to integrable systems. And I, I want to emphasize here that it was Mike who, in our collaboration, who really understood uh, the mechanics of doing matrix, matrix integrals, the uh, orthogonal polynomial method, the recursion relations, and the deeper meaning of that, and taught them to me. And uh, it was that that enabled us, in our collaboration at least, to, to reach these exact solutions. Now, more generally, as, as I was reflecting back on this, it was clear to me that Perestroika and Glasnost 
the developments in the Soviet Union around this time, this was around 1988, 1989, uh, played a role in all this. It's clear in these three collaborations that did this work around the same time. Edward Brezin collaborated with uh, Volodya Kazakov from the Soviet Union. David Gross collaborated with Sasha Migdal. And uh, although both, neither Douglas, uh, Michael Douglas or I were from the Soviet Union, we learned about this work because of the opening up. I, for example, first heard about these ideas at a conference in Armenia uh, in, uh, from a talk Dima Bulatov gave. And because these ideas were intensely developed in the Soviet Union, this opening up had a lot to do with this work emerging at that time. It's sobering given current events to realize, well, how long ago that was and, and how different a time that was. But that it, it, it was striking the, the advantages of that opening and the, the problems we're gonna have now when those openings have, have closed. Well, one of the things that these uh, connections to integrable systems uh, expose was there are connections in this problem to the KDV hierarchy. Roughly speaking, different KDV times realize <coughs> two-dimensional Liouville gravity coupled to the two comma P minimal models, and what have come to be called minimal strings. You can also describe these models by Verisora constraints, which are an equivalent uh, description. Now these one matrix integrals have a far reaching generalization, which for me was actually one of the most beautiful outcomes of the subject. Um, that the basic integral equation could be expressed, the basic equation can be expressed in this form, the familiar form of the commutators of P and Q being the identity, where these are differential operators. And this deep insight was, was due to Michael. And, and this, this equation, which has come to be called the Douglas equation, is, is for me one of the highlights of this whole development. And it was really impressive to see how Mike saw deeply into the, into the structure. And more prosaically, this structure realizes the general PQ minimal model coupled to two dimensional Leonard gravity. Now, these developments have significant uh, influence on mathematics. Particularly, Witten argued that the gromov witten and topological invariants of the moduli space of curves should be described by correlators in two-dimensional topological gravity, which is sort of the, the two comma one point in the KDV hierarchy, sort of the, the simplest point in the hierarchy. And then the above connections led him to conjecture that their generating function, that is the partition function, should be a tau function of the KDV hierarchy. And this was proved in remarkable work by Kansevich in a story many of you know. Now, knowing these gromov witten invariants in principle allows you to compute Ve peterson volumes in the moduli space, which I'll have more to say about later. Well, this is very exciting. There was a big wave of activity around this. And we did learn a few lessons about non-perturbative string theory from these models. But a few years later, maybe of order five years later, the string duality revolution occurred, bringing in an enormous number of non-perturbative insights into string theory. We learned about the role of brains and strong weak dualities and M-theory and gauge gravity duality. And our, from going from all, having almost no non-perturbative information, we went to having a whole host of insights into non-perturbative string theory. Well, the place of matrix models in these new frameworks was worked out in a couple of papers with uh, sort of, well, striking names. There was the C equals one matrix reloaded and a new hat for the C equals one matrix model. This is a paper that Mike participated in. Hat means C hat equals one. It's a supersymmetric reinterpretation of this model. Brains and topological strings, minimal string theory. But at least as I recall, there were such powerful tools available in more realistic situations. Here, realistic in quotes, that means string theories in higher dimensions where you have propagating gravitons and so on. But the continued importance of these simple models was unclear. Well, but certain questions were challenging, even with these new tools. 
and in particular, certain questions involving black holes. These questions included the famous uh, black hole information paradox, the nature of the individual black hole microstates, and of a special importance historically around 2013 was the AMPS, uh, Almeri, Marolf, Polchinski, and Sully <coughs> firewall paradox. And this catalyzed a renewed focus on all these issues. Now these questions concern weakly coupled theories, g string squared of order one over n squared in the boundary theory, but high energy states in these theories, energy of order n squared, these states involve n squared quanta. So perturbation theory is of limited utility. You have a weak coupling, but a lot of quanta interacting. So perturbation theory goes out of control, at least for certain quanta. Furthermore, these black holes states are, are thermal states. So supersymmetry is not a powerful constraint. Thermal uh, states upset the, the symmetry between fermions and bosons. And so supersymmetry just plays a subsidiary role. And because these systems thermalize, they are quantum chaotic. And this being there, that's often called fast scrambling. And so the answers to detailed questions will be intrinsically complicated. Now, simple models would be helpful here because there is, the questions are so hard. But matrix models, at least as we understood them, for instance, the C equals one quantum mechanics model are integrable. They describe systems of free fermions propagating in time in some, well, elaborate potential. But because the dynamics are free fermions, they never thermalize. And so they don't form black holes. Now, there's an interesting uh, caveat here, whether if you include non-singlet states, that's still true. But let me not talk about that now. Well, fortunately for the field around this time, another simple model was found, the suchdev ye kateyev model. This is an ordinary quantum mechanical model of N Majorana fermions coupled together four at a time. And the coupling, indicated by this number J sub ABCD, is a random coupling drawn from a Gaussian ensemble independently for every uh, quartet of fermions. This model has remarkable properties. It's chaotic. In fact, it has the maximal quantum Lyapunov exponent. But after averaging over this ensemble of couplings, it's solvable in a one over N expansion. It's in some sense, the best combination of vector-like models so it's solvable and it's got enough complication. It actually has what are called melonic diagrams that it can have quantum chaos. And so this model actually, well, as I'll mention in a minute, is holographic to a, a one plus one dimensional gravity theory that describes a black hole. And so this seems like it, it's a tool to answer uh, a lot of these uh, very difficult questions. Well, at this point, the idea of uh, fluctuating matrices came back in the day. It's a widely held belief, you could call it a uh, widely held conjecture, going back to Wigner, that the eigenvalues actually in the eigenstates of a, quantum, a chaotic quantum system, the energy eigenvalues, are distributed like those of a random matrix. Now here the matrix is the entire Hamiltonian of the system. In the boundary in ADS-CFT, this is the Hamiltonian of the full second quantized field theory. And this distributed like is a statistical statement involving some kind of averaging over an ensemble of Hamiltonians like SYK, where you have these ensemble of couplings, where you can average over different energy bands in the spectrum or average in other ways. Now, in contrast, the string world sheet pictures that I was describing earlier, the matrix is just some field in the field theory, like the vector potential, which is a matrix. And the averaging is over the quantum fluctuations in the path interval. Even just defining a single theory, you quantum average over A mu. So in super Yang Mills theory, A mu is an n by n matrix. But the Hamiltonian of super Yang Mills theory at least if you're focusing on states at a certain uh, temperature, is an e to the entropy by e to the entropy matrix where entropy is of order n squared. So these matrices are exponentially bigger than the ones we're familiar with. But still they involve some notion of random matrices, integrating matrices with some weight. 
Now, this idea, this random matrix universality, going back to Wigner, is very powerful. Many, well, some of us, I grew up uh, learning about Wilsonian universality. And this random matrix universality is, is a, a rather different kind. <clears throat> and it's less well understood than this Wilsonian universality. But this universality should be true uh, in any ads CFT Hamiltonian where black holes form, because black hole formation is uh, equivalent to the knowledge that the system is chaotic. So it's well worth understanding. <coughs> well, we can check this by probing the eigenvalue statistics of the SYK model. The right probe turns out to be something called the spectral form factor. It's the Fourier transform of the energy level differences. And you can think of it as the product of a pair of partition functions where beta is continued uh, to imaginary time. And this is a numerical plot. It's actually what led a large number of us to, to think about these issues more carefully. In the SYK model, averaged over an ensemble, I think here of 90 samples of these couplings. This initial region we call the slope is uh, not universal. It differs from model to model. But this ramp plateau structure is characteristic of random matrix statistics. And here you can see that the SYK model actually has such statistics. But further, as I mentioned, at low energies, the SYK model is actually dual in the ads CFT sense to a black hole in one plus one dimensional gravity, a particular kind of one plus one dimensional gravity called Jakeef Teitelboim, JT gravity. And we see that the boundary Hamiltonian has a lot of the characteristics of a random matrix. And so the question arose, uh, could this be another example of a matrix model, 2D gravity, of a 2D gravity matrix model correspondence? And the answer is yes. As I look back, it's, uh, it's amazing how long it took us to realize that something like this could be going on. But uh, all of us have been doing research and realize, uh, well, sometimes how hard it is to put together obvious things that are staring you in the face. But we got there. And so let me describe this in a little bit uh, more detail. This very simple Jakeef Teitelboim gravity is described by an action that looks like this schematically. You have a metric and a dilaton field. And you have the dilaton times R plus two integrating freely over the dilaton. This is a Lagrange multiplier that localizes geometries onto constant negative curvature metrics. And on the boundary, you have things that can fluctuate, weighted by the extrinsic curvature. And that gives you something called the Schwarzian dynamics of the boundary <laughs> mode. And then things are weighted by the Euler character of the surfaces, times the, the ground state entropy of this black hole. Ground state entropies, like all entropies of black holes, goes like one over G Newton, which would be like N of the SYK model. Surfaces with Euler character chi are weighted by e to the s naught chi. And for a surface with g handles and one boundary, that's e to the s naught, one minus two g. And we'll focus on an observable that in the original developments we called a macroscopic loop, which is just a trace of e to the minus beta h. And it inserts a loop of length beta into these world sheets, or for us, 2D space times. And of course, that's just the integral of the expectation value of the density of eigenvalues, where H is the, now the boundary Hamiltonian. Well, so now we can calculate this at leading order e to the s naught. You have a geometry that's a disk of const with constant negative curvature metric. And you have a fluctuating boundary. It's weighted by the Schwarzian dynamics. It turns out this integral over this fluctuating boundaries can be done exactly. It's one loop exact. And it gives, if you take the inverse Laplace transform of this, the leading order density of states. It's a disk, so it's weighted by e to the s naught, and it has this funny cinch square root of e form. And as we'll see in a minute, this density of states gives the spectral curve of the matrix model. And as Greg Moore pointed out to me, uh, this is also the spectral curve of a certain large end cyborg witten theory that he and Mike and I studied uh, many years later for, uh, for completely different purposes. And I had just completely forgotten about it until Greg pointed this out to me. 
Well, now let's study topologies beyond the disk. The leading contribution, if you have two macroscopic loops, that's two partition functions, it comes from two disconnected disks. It's not so interesting. The leading connected contribution comes from a cylinder topology, which has weighting e to the zero. And it gives the ramp in the spectral form factor. So this geometry already tells you something about random matrix statistics. To learn about uh, the rest of the curve, in particular the plateau, you have to sum over topologies. So we'll study, let's say, a topology with one boundary and any number of handles. The surfaces kind of look like this. And the partition function then are some numbers weighted by e to the one minus two g s naught. And this kind of pictures, as you all know, look like perturbative string genus expansion. But the perspective here is profoundly different. And this is something I need to underline. Here, the, what looks like G string, the genus weighting factor is e to the minus S naught. That's e to the minus one over G Newton. Ordinary string theory, you have powers of G Newton. Here, these are non-perturbative effects of G Newton. They're joining and splitting of baby universes in this two-dimensional space-time. This is like a third quantized description of one plus one dimensional worlds. Well, how do you do the sum over topologies? Well, this is in more detail what such a geometry looked like. You have these fluctuating boundaries joined on to a surface with arbitrary number of handles. You can always cut the surface into two parts a part we call the trumpet, and a part that corresponds to uh, many handles and a geodesic boundary of geodesic length B. And we actually can now sum over the full path integral of these geometries. This trumpet can be evaluated exactly. It's one loop exact. It gives a formula that looks like this. And this part, we're integrating over hyperbolic surfaces, constant negative curvature surfaces. And since the natural measure on that moduli space is the Ve peterson volume, it's not surprising that these things are given by the Ve peterson volume of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with a single geodesic boundary. But we know about this. In fact, these things can be computed efficiently. They could be computed in principle using the techniques of Witten and Konsevich but they can be computed efficiently using a remarkable recursion relation that Merzlikani wrote down, starting from the hyperbolic viewpoint. Like all these recursions, you build up higher genus surfaces from lower genus ones. And <coughs> this recursion can be mapped onto matrix model loop equations for resolvents in the streamlined form of topological recursion that Inard introduced as a powerful new machine in the matrix model arsenal. And this observation was made by Enard and Oranta. Now, the input into this topological recursion machine is the genus zero eigenvalue density. That gives you the spectral curve of the matrix model. And the cylinder diagram, which is universal for any one of these uh, uh, genus zero one cut matrix model. So, to get the um, what the basic observation of these people is to get these Ve Peterson volumes, you use this particular spectral curve, which just happens to be the eigenvalue density of JT gravity. So then when we saw that, we realized that we were on the right track. These things must fit together. And in fact, they fit together. Here's how you put it all together. The topological recursion actually produces these volumes as a function of this geodesic length as some integral transform of the genus G resolvent of a matrix model. So we'll call that integral transform I. And so then you write the partition function of JT gravity as the trumpet sewn onto this geodesic boundary, integrating over all geodesic lengths. That's the formula for the trumpet. That's the integral transform of the resolvent. It turns out that this trumpet plays nicely with the kernel of this integral transform. You can do the B integral and it gives the integral over a contour surrounding the cut in the resolvent of e to the minus beta x. That gives the integral over the discontinuity of the resolvent, which is just the genus G correction to the density of states 
times a Boltzmann factor. And that's just the partition function of a matrix model evaluated at genus G. And this is true to all orders in the genus expansion. So to all orders in the genus expansion, JT gravity is a matrix model. And any matrix model has random matrix eigenvalue statistics. So we've established that. Further, if you have some non-perturbative definition of the matrix interval, and these things suffer from the instabilities we're used to, so there's not a unique <coughs> choice, but there are choices. You have a non-unique, non-perturbative definition of JT gravity. All right, so in some sense, we've, we've understood now why JT gravity uh, is a matrix model and why in this system you have random matrix statistics. But the perspective here is very strange. JT gravity is precisely dual in the ADS CFT sense to an ensemble of boundary Hamiltonians, an ensemble given by a random matrix ensemble with some potential V of H tuned to give the leading JT density of states. And because it's such a random matrix, random matrix statistics are exact. Now, this is formally analogous to these old by now, the ones that Mike and I and others worked on, matrix models of string theory, where you couple the two comma P minimal model to Liouville gravity, and you take the P going to infinity limit. P going to infinity makes the Liouville C going to infinity and then makes the curvature R equals minus two a constraint, not just an equation of motion in Liouville. So that's where you get R equals minus two as a constraint. Now a further rescaling of eigenvalues puts the macroscopic loop boundary at infinite distance as we're used to in ads -CFT. So if you massage these old strings in a certain way, <coughs> you land on this description. But let me emphasize again, this is a different perspective. The string joining and splitting is actually baby universes, baby one plus one dimensional universes in JT gravity, joining and splitting. The genus expansion parameter is non-perturbative in G Newton. The matrix is not like an N by N yang mills field. It's the full second quantized boundary Hamiltonian, effectively e to the entropy by e to the entropy. We're talking about something that might be called third quantization. Now, this thing that we're led rather naturally to is very strange from the ads <coughs> point. We see that gravity in the bulk is naturally dual to an ensemble of boundary Hamiltonians. And in fact, this ensemble seems closely related to the old fluctuating bulk coupling story of Coleman and getting strominger which also involved these wormhole cylinder type geometries. Now, let me now turn to uh, trying to get at the bottom of the strangeness. And as, as usual in this subject, uh, when you have, uh, you know, when you see something new, some more puzzles emerge. So here's a puzzle. Gauge gravity duality as we understood it involves a single boundary Hamiltonian, like super yang mills theory. You don't average over boundary Hamiltonians. These questions about like why you have random matrix statistics and super yang mills theories are currently too hard to answer. We just don't have enough control over the high energy uh, states of this very complicated uh, system. So we can ask a, make a toy model for non-average behavior. We can take a single mem member of the ensemble and ask, for instance, how do things change from one element in the ensemble to another? Now, a basic result, <coughs> if wormholes dominate, if the simplest topology dominates, uh, is that the variance of the spectral form factor, this Fourier transform, in the ensemble is an order of the signal squared. And the way you see that is you take the square of the spectral form factor. Here's one copy of the spectral form factor with a left and a right boundary. Here's a second copy with a left and a right boundary. And then you can take the ensemble average of this square, and you find there are two topological contributions, this one and this one, but also this crossed one. So the variance of this quantity is like the signal, this is the signal squared. That means that the answer depends sensitively on the element of the ensemble. It's noisy. And so this is what the spectral form factor actually looks like for a single sample in the SYK model 
And by random matrix universality, this is what it will look like in super Yang Mills. The blue line here is this average over the ensemble. But for a single sample, you get this red erratic curve. The log log plot, so this constant width, means that the, the, the standard deviation is of order of the signal. Now, what accounts for the noise in this bulk description? That is, in gravity, there must be something that accounts for this erratic behavior. Well, in JT, this is actually a picture of one spectrum. And you can think of this erratic stuff as due to the actual you know, individual <coughs> eigenvalues of the single draw from this ensemble. Well, in this JT random matrix ensemble idea, a single draw from the ensemble corresponds to a fixed choice of eigenvalues. These were called eigenbrains in this uh, very interesting paper. This is elaborated on in this paper and especially in this really beautiful paper that was able to analyze what happens when you fix eigenvalues really rather precisely. Now, I'm not gonna discuss that here. Um, well, it would take me a bit of field and also I, I wanna discuss some more basic intuitions. Um, but it leads us to a picture that what you have to add to this kind of smooth gravitational description is something called a half of one of these wormholes. Now, where does that weird notion come from? Well, um, there's an analogy that we can make. One of the places where we understand chaotic systems best is in semi-classical chaos. Take an ordinary quantum mechanical system, like a billiard moving on a billiard table, and then quantize it. And the way you study this is you use the path interval. In this place, the precise form is called a Gutzwiller trace formula. You take trace of e to the minus i h t. That's the <coughs> sum over all paths of e to the i times the action, the classical action of the path. The spectral form factor becomes a double sum over paths weighted by e to the i s and e to the minus i s because of this uh, minus sign here. Well, you have this double sum and you can kind of represent a cartoon of that. It looks like a boundary with one erratic path here and another erratic path here. Long times, you have long classical orbits. The phase, that is the action is large. So these phases fluctuate a lot. On averaging over time or over an ensemble of different systems, the only things that survive are places where the path here is the same as the path here up to some overall time translation. This is Barry, Michael Berry's famous diagonal approximation. It gives the ramp. And you can see this ravage, this averaging sewing these two kind of half wormholes together, giving the wormhole that gives the ramp. Well, so the wormhole that gives the smooth contribution comes from the diagonal term in the sum. The noise, that erratic red curve, <coughs> comes from the off diagonal terms of which there are a lot. So you can represent the diagonal term by this wormhole and the off diagonal terms by these half wormholes where this linked line here represents that if you just take the off diagonal terms, the diagonal ones are absorbed in this smooth picture. <coughs> and this seems to be the kind of picture that emerges from a more careful study of this model. Well, one way we can try to address this problem is go back to the SYK model. We can try to study the SYK model with a single fixed choice of the random couplings J, A, B, C, D. It's only a sketch of what this works like here. The more precise analysis is in this paper. Now, actually, this problem, even though the SYK is a toy model, we can do an enormous amount, is too hard for us. The only really precise analysis we could do is in a toy model of this toy model, a toy squared model. We consider SYK at one time point where the Grassmann variables as a function of time, this is what gives you quantum mechanical <coughs> fermions, becomes Grassmann variables at one time point, just an ordinary Grassmann number. The partition function at one time point is just the integral over one n Grassmann numbers 
of the product of these groups of four Grassmann numbers times this random coupling drawn from a Grassian ensemble. If you have a left and a right partition function, you have two Grassmann intervals with the same J's. Well, we can study this. You introduce collective fields, which are just numbers uh, corresponding to like psi A left times psi A right. And you can rewrite Z left, Z right in terms of these collective fields. When you average over J's, you get a simple description. This has saddle points in these collective fields when these numbers have absolute value one. And you can think about when you have a saddle point here as analogous to a wormhole. So you have some connection between the left and the right systems. That's reasonable because you've averaged the same J over the left and the right system. And so this averaging induces correlation. In the analogy, this saddle point looks like a wormhole. You can also write down this integral in terms of collective fields. These things are actually kind of the analog of gravity with fixed J's. Now you get some integral where the weighting factor depends in a complicated way on J. It's explicit. You can compute it numerically just by doing this integral. It's just an integral over two n Grassman numbers. You can do it in the computer if you want. So there's an explicit formula for this. And it's a black box containing all the microscopic information of one draw. It's an exact expression. Now, this thing has order one noise. That is dependence on the choice of J. This should have a J in it. And where in this integral, it's an ordinary integral over two numbers, does it come from? It turns out the G integral is J independent. So we can do it first, giving a Z left, Z right, is the integral over this one number of some function of this one number. Where is the noise in F? We can't compute it directly. We could do it numerically, but uh, we can't do it analytically. But using the power of ensembles, we can compute its statistical properties. The expectation value of X squared is computable by introducing additional collective fields and evaluating the integral by saddle points. You can compare it to the expectation value of F, the quantity squared, where the expectation value of F just determines uh, this wormhole's value. This is a plot of sigma. It's a one-dimensional integral. If, if the second moment of sigma is equal to the average squared, then the noise at sigma is small. It's self-averaging. If it's if this is much larger than this, it's non-self-average. And so on the plot, you can calculate that you have a region of self-averaging behavior and a region of non-self-averaging behavior. The wormhole saddle point is in the self-averaging region. It persists with small corrections. Here, and you're doing the integral here, it's non-self-averaging. This is where the noise comes from. So you can study where the biggest values of F are that make the biggest contribution to this integral. You can study FRMS as the square root of the eight squared, and you can plot it as an action, the log of it, and you find this curve like this. Here's the wormhole saddle point, but you find another region in the non-self-averaging region that gives a, as big a contribution. This new saddle point is the analog of this half wormhole saddle. And its contribution averages, vanishes when you average. This is the curve when you average. There's a large negative action. It gives exponentially small contribution. So you find when you don't average that there are actually two contributions, a wormhole and a noisy contribution. And a plausible scenario then for the full SYK if you just look, let's say one partition function, this is described by the disk plus a half wormhole, this other saddle point. This depends sensitively on the J's, this doesn't. And the question we're left with is what is the gravitational meaning of these half wormhole saddles? And we only have a very limited view on this now. Somehow these things look like these trumpets, 
and they end with some kind of boundary condition. And this is, well, at or a little beyond the state of the art. Understanding what these are is really crucial for really understanding what you need to add to conventional gravity to reproduce the noise that is inherent in these quantum chaotic systems. Well, that actually brings me to the end of my talk. And so let me just conclude by wishing Mike a happy birthday. Mike, I can assure you from my own experience that turning 60 is not the end of the world. I understand from you that uh, you're gonna be thinking intensively about science now, which is a very good news for all of us. And I'm just gonna close by asking whether or not we can borrow a little bit of your insight to try to resolve this hard question about where the noise and, is in, in a real theory of quantum gravity. So I'll stop there. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. That, that really was a great talk. I mean, it's, it's, it's as inspiring as ever. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we should uh, have some longer discussion. I mean, I don't have any immediate insights. I'm, 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 I'm curious, even from the starting point, I mean, I, 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 I see that SYK is a model of quantum chaos, and you expect chaos as a defining feature of a black hole. But, uh, can, can we see any more about the starting point? You know, why, why should, you know, you, I mean, did, why, why did averaging over the couplings besides just being a toy source of chaos, you know? Did, was there some, some other motivation? Was there something analogous to that? You're, you're trying to reason from the properties of the result. And if, like, like, what do you know about the, the starting point? Well, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I think we believe, I mean, I was using chaos in, in kind of a, a number of different contexts. Um, as you know, you know, in classical chaos, uh, you can think about uh, it being, uh, you can talk about the Lyapunov properties of a flow. The, at short times, the trajectories exponentially diverge, and there's a quantum version of that. And that we believe is true of the SYK model, even without <laughs> averaging these out of time order correlators that turn out to be the quantum diagnostic are these self averaging properties. You can compute them easily by averaging, but then you can compute the uh, variance between different members of the ensemble and, and show it's small. So although it's hard to compute, I, I, maybe I'll back up. The averaging is a powerful tool in order to calculate with. If you take a given value of J's, it's, it's really, we have no tools to evaluate this SYK model except numerics. It turns out when you average, all of a sudden you have uh, very powerful tools to describe the average. You can introduce these collective fields that, and that have, they have a simple behavior. For things at short time and, and certain things like entropies and thermodynamic properties, these things are self-averaging. You can then ask how much do they vary from member to the member of the ensemble by computing the variance you can establish it small so you know indirectly that a given Hamiltonian will have Lyapunov properties. And then in fact, people have gone and calculated this numerically and have seen that this is in fact correct. You know, as you know, you have the uh, exponential barriers to numerics and that the dimension of the Hilbert space goes exponentially in N and the time to diagonalize a matrix grows as uh, some not small power of the rank of the matrix. So the time to diagonalize these matrices gets prohibitive uh, as n gets large. Maybe a quantum computer would uh, be more helpful. But in terms of, of addressing the, the initial SYK model itself, um, this seems hard. And may, maybe there's, a, there, there's some hidden uh, tools to do it, although the fact that it's quantum chaotic uh, suggests that uh, life is not going to be easy. So, and this is some of the same difficulty in understanding high energy states and super Yang Mills theory. Uh, you know, the fact that they're chaotic means that the tools are gonna have to be, uh, well, they're gonna have to be able to capture that chaos. It, it, of course, it's reminiscent. You know, we know this isn't necessarily the case. You know, there are these wonderful mathematical examples that I guess you've heard uh, talk about that I, I should listen to. 
about the Riban zeta function, this very structured, simple uh, thing that produces a chaotic spectrum of the zeros, which are the analog of the energy eigenvalues. And so you might imagine that there is some, if you will, rather simple object. I think the analog would be the primes. That would be really the thing that would describe the bulk. And then that would have buried in it the quantum chaos. But we don't know, if you will, what the, what the primes are in quantum gravity. So uh, maybe that, that's a set of comments. Talk by uh, Alec Kahn, uh, developing his, uh, his version of those ideas about the, uh, the zeta function. I don't, I don't think anything recorded, but certainly his, his work might be inspiring. But I mean, uh, you know, I mean again, we're, is there anything that in the string theory that we understand that, that looks like this on you know ensemble averaging and, and that's why I mean we have a the definitions of black holes or like thermal state and you know engaged theory you know and ADS and uh, then that's not an ensemble averaging itself that's a that's a density matrix but is there, if we look at some piece of that system does it look like an ensemble average? Yeah, so the well, we don't, and, you know, actually, we don't, we don't know how to calculate much. Um, and it's hard to define an ensemble in, in super Yang Mills. There's no natural things to average over. You could average over the string coupling or something, but that, that's not enough averaging. There's an interesting recent proposal by Maloney, Collier, Tom Hartman, and one other author that I'm forgetting, where that you could try to produce an approximate ensemble. Uh, in super Yang Mills by considering approximate solutions of the bootstrap equations. That is, you could define a conformal field theory, let's say uh, three plus one dimensions by its bootstrap data. And then you could demand, let's say that all the low energy data, the things that you want to produce ordinary gravity are fixed at the ordinary values of the bootstrap. But the very high energy states that their data, their operator product coefficients and their uh, conformal weights, which are the energy eigenvalues, would be random. And that statistically that would solve the bootstrap equations. And they've shown that when you do that um, and you average over the high energy data, you get certain kinds of wormholes. And the wormholes come from this averaging in a little bit of the way that I described. And so if you, you could then think of what you would sort of need to add if you don't average. <clears throat> so I think there's, there's a lot of indications, in particular the factorization puzzle, that these wormholes are gonna be connected to uh, averaging. And that if you don't average, you're gonna need at least the wormhole plus something else. And so that's the state, that I think is the best idea I've seen about how you would incorporate these ensemble ideas into super Yang Mills. Things like the uh, things that we usually compute, like the uh, free energy or the entropy by looking at the area horizon, those are self-averaging properties. If you took an ensemble of the kind I'm discussing, you would find that the corrections due to the ensemble of such a thing would be exponentially small in the entropy. And so all the calculations done to date are fine. Uh, it's just that there will be a small amount of noise coming from the fact that the spectrum is really discrete, that gravity doesn't know how to see. Okay. Greg, you, you have your hand up. I do. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, I had um, I had two questions. Um, one one is um, you said you don't you don't know how to calculate these. Um, these finite Grassmann integrals, like yes. Uh, so, what if, what if you started imposing symmetry constraints on the uh, on on the coupling J and increased um, increased it from a a four fermion interaction to an two n from uh, fermion interaction? I mean, if you combine those two di question. two ideas, I mean, maybe you could start to get analytical results for a fixed J. I think actually. If you have enough Grassmanns, you, you might actually be able to reproduce a, a random matrix ensemble. You know, you, you would be like taking the, the Clifford basis for matrices or something. Right. And, right. and so then I think what you might find is if you don't impose any constraints and you do things right, you might get a random matrix ensemble. 
you have to be careful if you impose too many constraints that the model might, might stop becoming chaotic. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought you were going to say. But maybe maybe you could, by by increasing the the number of uh, making yeah. two n two n fermion interactions and also impose some symmetry. There might be some that, that would be really in, that would be really interesting. Um, we went into kind of the opposite direction and studied a model with just two fermions. Uh -huh. So okay. <laughs> so which is not chaotic, but, but then you're not going to have chaos, right, right? Right. Right. But but we could at least see that we could at least evaluate these non-self averaging and averaging regions analytically. Uh -huh. So uh, it. it uh, that was the, that was the only thing we were able to do, and we were able to do numerics very efficiently there. It turns out that this problem of computing even numerically a Grassmann integral is extremely difficult. It's this, you know, in quantum in complexity quantum complexity theory, these Fafians are hard to compute, whereas right. determinants are easy to compute. Sure. <laughs> and so this this uh, we actually had trouble computing things numerically, but that that I mean another comment I can make in this. Uh, is that there are these rather structured versions of the SYK model that, well, uh, Witten brought to the attention of the community, where you actually have fixed couplings and you have a, a gauge symmetry, and you have this set of melonic diagrams oh, okay. with fixed couplings. And there we believe because the diagrams look the same that those also have Lyapunov behavior. Unfortunately, those are no easier for us to diagonalize or integrate over the couplings. But that's a, that's an example of maybe a, a toy analog of Super Yang Mills, you know, a rather structured set of couplings, but the system is nonetheless chaotic. But even that toy model, we don't know what to do with. Okay. Uh, and for technical so, reasons, it's even hard to do numerics on. So, so I had a second question, which yes. is I don't understand this half trumpet at all. Good. So <laughs> you were you were drawing something which implied the following to me. Yes. You were drawing something that. It's it's just a trumpet with an unusual boundary condition, right? You yes. drew a trumpet with a wiggly line. Is is that yeah. what you think it is? It's it's actually just it is a a smooth geometry, well, but with a strange boundary condition. Yeah, I think I think the best. I mean, again, we we don't know. We, I mean, the, the fair answer is we don't know. In some of these toy models, I think the best toy model is this. Uh, uh, for for understanding this, is this. Uh, um, where you take the random matrix integral that describes average JT gravity, and you just say, forget it. I'm going to take one draw of the random matrix. I'm going to fix the energy eigenvalue. Right, right. Now, as you remember from, uh, I, th I think we learned this from your paper with uh, Madhusena, Cyberg, and Xi, if you fix an eigenvalue, that's a lot like inserting a determinant operator. Right. And that's a brain. Uh, I guess it's an FZZT brain. Right. And that corresponds to some geometry with a brain boundary condition. Okay. And the, the value of the energy eigenvalue determines something about that boundary condition. Right. So the, the, the detailed nature of the draw from the ensemble is encoded, roughly speaking, the location of those brains. I see. That's where that intuition comes from. And in when you said well, it's, Yeah, it's, it came from that and a couple of other sort of half assed places. But now, I mean, it might be in Super Yang Mills that what is involved is, you know, some you what you really need to understand is what is the microscopic origin of these discrete states, this thing that people in the fuzzball program have been trying to understand. And if there is some dynamic, some fluctuating string near the horizon, you might imagine a trumpet ending on that fluctuating string, and the wiggly lines could be having something to do with that fluctuating string. The problem but again, is, that's a very unusual, it's just an unusual boundary condition from drawn from. Right. And, and the problem is, if you want chaos, that boundary condition has to come from some chaotic system. Right. You know, so, so we don't, we don't know is the first, that that's the state of the art or a little beyond the state of the art, okay. what I've just told you, but there's gotta be something <laughs> because this okay. random matrix universality tells you that super Yang Mills is going to be noisy. And so the, well, all right, that, I told you all or a little bit more than I know. Oh, thanks for a really beautiful talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, were there other questions? Uh, hi, Steve. It's Volodya. Hi, Volodya. How are you? Hi. Uh, you scarcely mentioned uh, the C plus one black hole. Yes. Which is 
in our old paper with Ivan and Kutasov, uh, where uh, as a result, we get a black hole background. Uh, I mean, we don't know about background, but we get a matrix model of black hole due to some well-established yeah. duality. But all that is still integrable. Uh, uh, it, it is yeah, that to the equations. So somehow it looks like a contradiction to what you you have said in this talk. Yeah, well, yeah, I I, always, I have uh, worried about this. Yeah, um, I worry about this. I've worried about this. I don't understand what you know. I mean, it it might be that this stringy black hole is somehow. <clears throat> You know, not to, doesn't thermalize. I mean, that I I, I really don't understand how uh, how, the, how that integrable system can can really truly be thermal. It would have to be if you looked at the spectrum of the radiation. It wouldn't look like yeah. a black body. One hint on it is that if you include more complicated states like vertices instead of vortices, then it becomes completely unintegrable and. Only Sorry, if you include which state, which states? If you start testing it by vertex excitations instead of vortices, then you'll see immediately that it's not an integrable case. Well, that's interesting. I, I yeah. Sorry, I may, maybe I don't remember which which perturbation do you want to add to make it not integrable? You, you know, there are vortices and vertices in this uh, two-dimensional string theory. Yes. Uh, like we build our background black black hole the background from vortices, but we have to test it by uh, by some local uh, excitations yeah. like vertices. And then if you try to include vertices immediately, it, it is not- what is, what, oh, So maybe that, maybe I hadn't understood that. So maybe there's a way, at least, you know, perturbatively of thinking about, uh, you know, that that, that incurred, that, that, encourages coupling between different modes or something that makes the theory uh, not integrable and that and that that would be the analog of a black hole is there anything that one could do uh to study that model like even numerically or something that's a long-standing question and the calculations become very tough at this point because it's yeah but i mean but I, my standards are lower than yours I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, is there some, is there some, you know, I don't, you know, can you diagonalize, you no. know, 10 by 10 matrices or something? And, Maybe. Uh, I mean, that, that would be great to have another, another model in the zoo. I mean, I put that comment about non-singlet states in there because of that, precisely that uh, issue, which I don't understand. But I, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing to, to understand. We should, we should correspond about that. Well, we should talk if we ever see each other in real life. But uh, barring that, we can exchange. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Steve, I, well, maybe, maybe uh, you can imagine that uh, if you take uh, one matrix model which with a central chart, which is tending to minus infinity, which is very large and negative, then yes. you can reproduce this metric in the JT uh, gravity uh, because yes. the, the fluctuations are suppressed uh, uh, when the central charge is very, very low. Uh, yes. So uh, is, is it crucial that you take an ensemble of, uh, of matrix models with P, uh, with P from, some, from 1 to infinity? No, we don't take that. We, oh, we, we just take, we take one matrix model with larger and larger P. Ah, uh, I see, ah, I see. Uh, the, okay, then, then uh, I see. So you can say, you can take a, any matrix model uh, with a negative uh, central charge, which uh, you can solve, yes. No, not only that, this, uh, Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, this. I, you have to be a little careful, I mean, that, this is a question, I think, about adding matter to JT gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, you might say, oh, let's take uh, JT gravity and put an icing model on it in a way that you guys understand very well. Uh, I model, believe... The model raises the central charge, it's not good. But... Uh, uh, no, but then, then put... Then add a couple to something with P going to minus infinity and get it negative. Uh, 
Oh, I, oh, I, right, then yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think one of the things that happens is you cross the C rate equals one barrier. You start having tachyon, bad tachyons. Um, but uh, no, it should be negative. The central charge should, should be very negative and large. Yeah, but but I think if you work in this so-called, we have to get rid of the the negative uh, dimension operator. We have to actually work where the cosmological constant is set with the identity. So we have to sort of fine tune and go to what is it that I think it's Greg and Nadi called the conformal frame or something. We have to fine tune the spectral curve a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't, well, there, there are some models, uh, non-unitary, of course, like uh, the yeah, yeah. Uh, for example, well, when um, uh, during the talk of um, uh, of Sasha Gorsky, we discussed the O minus two model. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, if you take the O minus two model in the dense phase, not in the dilute the phase, then it will have central charge minus infinity. That's interesting. Does it have a continuum limit? I mean, does it does it look like gravity, or is it just a? You can you can take uh, you can take uh, any n. You can solve the, the equations. You have the central charge, which depends which follows the KPD scaling. And in the limit, when n goes to minus two, it goes to minus infinity. I so see. Then That's interesting. Okay. To the same to the same critical to the this same answer. Yeah, this is, all this is quite possible. Simply the yeah. this multi-critical uh, one. Do, do you know what the, does he know what the spectral curve is? Oh uh, yes, of course. Yes. What is it? it is it the, what is it? Oh uh, well, it, it's um, uh, it's a logarithm, but you have singularity with this. Uh, okay, that. Uh, I mean, again, again, the subtlety is you have to get rid of all these negative dimension operators. You have to consider pure Liouville with just the identity operator. None of these negative dimension things. You have to fine tune hey, the model. Sure a lot of neg neg negative. Yeah, so maybe there's a way of fine tuning other couplings in the model to hit this. But, you know, the, the spectral curve, Mike, of these P two comma key models turns out to be related to Chebyshev polynomials. And the cinch comes as a limit of Chebyshev polynomials, which was what you taught me in this large N super, you know, this large N cyber Witten case. And, uh, it's another example of my just forgetting. Greg had to remind me about this. Yeah, the, the difference, uh, the, diff the difference between uh, this uh, uh, the uh, multi-critical point models and the ON model in, in this limit is that uh, in uh, in those models the uh, the uh, world sheet has a, a fractal dimension uh, two uh, twice more than the boundary. And here in the O minus two model, uh, the boundary and the, the bulk have uh, <coughs> uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, scaling. It's not the same. Does that mean the surface is torn up somehow into some kind of fractal? Uh, may, uh, I, I would say that it's shrink. It's, uh, it's um, uh, oh, I forgot the scaling, but uh, uh, not torn up, but uh, the, uh, the, the area is very small. The boundary becomes huge. Uh, I see. That, that doesn't sound like constant negative curvature. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, constant negative curvature, of course, the, you know, everything is out at the, end, at the boundary. I mean, I guess the question is, does it, does it look like constant negative curvature or no? So it depends if you... If you uh, uh, if you say that the bulk is classical, then the boundary is not classical at all. It doesn't scale as square root of the uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Well, that, that's that's true. That's true in in constant negative curvature that the boundary scales <coughs> like the area. I mean, so that that's that's just a geometrical effect of constant negative curvature. I thought it should be the same. Whatever model you consider the C equals to minus infinity, it will lead to the same, more or less, uh, to the same answer to you, as you got. Except, except for this fine tuning of operators, but that maybe that's possible to do here. Um, there are different boundaries. Also. Maybe, maybe this is yeah. Maybe there is something, something different. 
I didn't think about it. I mean, one open, interesting open question is adding matter to these theories, which, you know, and, and you know, whether or not there's, there's a way of doing that that doesn't touch off tachyon instabilities and so on. Uh, that, that, that's an open, people are working on that, although I, in a way that's rather different than the way that I learned from you guys. So uh, that, that's something to think about. In particular, maybe you can add matter that doesn't, uh, if there is a bad tachyon, maybe you can add it with the uh, n component matter and n goes to zero. And so the loops, the bulk loops don't matter or something. I mean, but that, that's an open question that would be good to understand. Well, I guess there, I guess there are no more questions. Let me let me just say again that I'm happy to be able to speak at this equation. Sorry, I'm not there in person for personal reasons and for professional reasons. And I hope I get a chance to see all of you in person. Well, before too long.